Good morning. I am Mary Davidge. I am the director of campus design in Ruse. And this morning, I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing Bill McDonough. Bill is a visionary. He's an amazing optimist. Uh, and beyond that, he has had an architectural practice and consulting practice, McDonough Innovation, for over 40 years. He was the founder of the Cradle to Cradle Certific Product Certification Institute, wrote, co-authored two great books, Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things, and Upscaling, um, Beyond Sustainability, Designing for Abundance. Great books. He's also been a long time speaker at the World Economic Forum at Davos, 15 times he's spoken that there. So you are in for a real treat today. And what you may not know about him, which is pretty great at Google, for many years he has helped us at Ruse to develop our healthy materials program and to make sure that we are all breathing clean air and living in the cleanest building products that we can. So join me in welcoming him. It's going to be a great treat for you. Hi, everybody. I'm here um, because when Mary asked me if this was of interest, of course it is, because Google has been one of the most astonishing leaders in the areas that we care about, in sustainability, cradle to cradle, circular economy, and so on. So it's a, it's a real privilege to be here. I've worked with Google for almost uh, 20 years, maybe. Um, so I want to talk about design as optimism, because people ask, you know, what, what gets you up in the morning? And what gets me up in the morning is the fact that, that I'm actually designing for children. And I have the privilege of having children. One of my children is actually here. And I like the idea we design for 10-year-olds. And so when you think about it, the future generations are really the design assignment. And it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be able to work toward those children and their health and their, their joy. So that's really the optimism, is to make the world better for them. Now, as an architect, the first job of an architect is to change the way you see. Then we rearrange the furniture, then we build. So start by changing the way you see. This poem by Hildegard von Bingen from 1124, uh, glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars, gaze at the beauty of Earth's greenings, now think. This is a really important set of of phrases because glance, see, gaze, think is really important, especially when we realize what a delight it is to be here on this planet in the natural context. But this last uh, section concerns me because the language we use here can be so sadly interpreted. All nature is at the disposal of humankind. We are to work with it, for without it we cannot survive. This is what translates into sustainability. And I, I won the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development from President Clinton, 1996. And we were in the ceremony, and one of the reporters came up and said, Mr. Sustainable, uh, what does it all mean? And I remember looking at him and saying, I'm not that really interested in sustainability. And what's your relationship to your spouse? If you say sustainable, I'd say, I'm sorry. <laughs> it sounds kind of boring, really. It's, uh, what is this, maintenance? So it's really important to look at this phrase, these phrases, because this is about a concept known as usufruct. It's the idea that things are there for our use, right? And this, they're there for our use. But if you go to native peoples, they talk about being in relation with the natural world. And that's really, I think, what I'd like to talk about today, use, but also relationships. So I see us all as designers because we all have intentions. And design is the first signal of human intention. So when you get up in the morning and you have intentions to make Google more sustainable here in New York, right? you have intentions every morning, and then you have to go out there and see how well you're doing against those and try and get everybody else to align with your intentions. So I think design is intention. And so what is our intention? To make the world a worse place? Anybody got that when they get up in the morning? 
like I'm going to get out there and do something worse, right? It's hard to imagine that, really. I'm sure there are people you know, who are doing that, but perhaps not intentionally. So that becomes a question. How about let's get out there and be less bad? Oh, really? See, if you, being less bad is not being good. It's being bad, by definition, just less so. So let's get out there and be bad, just less so. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? But that's what we do. So let's start with where we are and see if we can see something different. So for me, I was born in Tokyo in 1951. And as a baby, we would wake up in the middle of the night. We lived in a traditional Japanese house with paper walls. And we would hear the farmers coming in to, to collect our sewage to take back to the farms with their ox carts on the cobblestones. They'd wake us up. And my mother would come in and put us back to sleep by singing folk songs from Alabama with her southern accent in Japanese with words she was making up that had to do with poop. And it was about the honey wagons coming in to collect the night soil to take it to the farms to bring us our food the next day. And you're three years old, and your mother is singing you know, poop songs in Japanese with a southern accent. Anyway, heaven. So there it was. So I always thought the cities and the farms are one organism. And, but I also got to, became aware of Hiroshima, because I was five years old when I discovered Hiroshima. And it started with a picture in Life magazine. And I looked at it, and I said, what is this? And they said, this is war. War is when we kill the children. So what I'm looking at here is the idea of waging peace. And so when I got to college, I went to the physics professor, and I said, how do you make a city disappear in five seconds? It takes thousands of years to make things and seconds to destroy them. Building is slow. Destruction is fast. How, how is that possible? And he gave me the special theory of relativity and said, here, read this, solve this equation, E equals mc squared. All right, you're all smart people. Have you all solved E equals mc squared? Anybody here? Ha! You want to do it? Why not? If you ask the question, how does a city disappear, all of a sudden it starts to look a little different because c is the number and the constant. So that's to me almost infinity because that's bigger than I can imagine, speed of light. And then Square it, just in case it's not big enough. All right, so call it almost infinity squared. Oh, boy. And then that means that if m is in any way a positive number, as in one hydrogen atom, then the e is almost infinity squared. That is the atom bomb. There it is. Nuclear power. But if we then look at the planet, we realize that that's coming from the sun and it hits the earth, which is materials and water, mass, m, and Einstein was really dealing with physics and chemistry. Isn't that interesting? But who are we? See, we are not physics and chemistry. We are what happened when those two things get together. We're biology. And so it's interesting to note in Latin that the roots for these three words are the same. Humus, human, humility. To be humble is to be grand grounded. Isn't that something? We are of the soil. So Francis Crick pointed out, nine years after discovering DNA, Cambridge with James Watson, that in order to be a living thing, you have to have growth, in order to have growth, because otherwise you, you're dying. If you have more cells dying than growing, you're dying. So you have to have income if you're going to have growth. And income comes from the sun. It comes from carbon from the atmosphere and nitrogen from the atmosphere. And you have to have an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organisms and their reproduction. So here we go. So I thought, well, what if we could design with this? So let's first by start by saying, what is going on with all this eco-efficiency stuff where I'll try and be less bad and think I'm being good? So let's have a goal. Let's make a less bad goal and see how excited you are about getting up in the morning. Let's be optimistic. We're going to make a world that's less unsafe, less unhealthy, less unjust, with less polluted air, less polluted soil, water, and power, and economically driven. How are we doing? Is this it? Get up in the morning, go get it done, right? Whereas you know how to search. Why don't you search for this? A delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, soil, water, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed. There. So. If all we do is report, as they are in so many, in, as we see in so many corporate sustainability reporting <coughs> and corporate social responsibility reporting, um, reporting, 
we see all these charts like this, even with carbon dioxide emissions. It's like, I'm going to be reduce, I'm going to reduce my emissions by 20% by 2020, and my goal is zero. Toxins, I'm going to reduce my toxics by 20% by 2020, my goal is zero. Really, think about that for a minute. You're telling the children your goal is nothing, and they're making it difficult for you to do nothing because you have to feed and clothe them. That's not too exciting. And then you're telling them that's what you're not going to do. That would be like me jumping in a taxi and saying, quick, I'm not going to the airport. Is this really useful, what we're not going to do? So what if we take this and say, let's not make that on the top chart. Let's put that underneath and say, what we don't want, we put below. What we do want, we put above. And let's just imagine having zero of the bads and 100% of the goods. We talk about selling goods and services. Well. What if you've actually thought about it and said, I sell bads. Today I'm going to try and sell less bads. Right? We, we call them goods. And then we also realize, as you, I'm sure you're aware, that the, most of the economy is actually trading. And the amount that's in goods and services is actually probably about 20%. The rest of it's arbitrage and fooling around with numbers. So th the actual basis of the economy is, t is a small part of it, but it's fundamental because it's the context in which we have life. So our choice is, are we designing for the top part of this picture, or are we designing for the bottom part of this picture? So that's the question. So let's go do it. What is designed for good? So the Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 of them, have been put forward by the UN now. They're much, I think, better than the former Millennial Goals because they're quite precise and they're quite clear. And there's nothing here I think anybody here would say is not a good idea. And you know, let us know if you think so. And the, the circular economy is certainly an important one, but it's just right here. It's number 12. It's one. But well, a lot of business people, when they say, oh, 17 goals, how can I do all that? Well, you can, actually. And I'll show you now with cradle cradle thinking. If you do material health, circular economy, material utilization, uh, renewable energy, water stewardship, and social fairness, you can do all 17 at once. But it's not going to help us, for example, to have a circular economy circulating bads. Because all you're doing is recirculating the bads. Like, let's say if you have toxic products and you recirculate them, you retoxify. You're putting the re back into the resource. But what if the source is toxic? Just remember, a toxin is a material in the wrong place, the wrong dose, the wrong duration. Water is highly toxic. If I surround you with this for six minutes, you're dead. If you jump out of an airplane, and hit the ocean at terminal velocity, very, very short duration, very big dose, you're dead. So materials in the wrong place, wrong dose, wrong duration are toxic. We don't say to the children of Flint, we're going to reduce the lead in your water by 20% by 2020. <laughs> when you have a toxin, you stop. You stop. So starting in 1992, working with Michael Browngard, chemist, we created criteria that we use. No more cancer. No more disruption of endocrine systems, genetic mutations, reproductive toxicities, and birth defects. Why can't we design these out? Precautionary principle. If it could cause that problem, why have it? Just move on. Don't argue about the little doses. Talk about getting rid of it. We looked at environmental criteria, toxicity for fish, for vertebrates, invertebrates, uh, plants. We look at toxic heavy metals, persistence, and so on. And then we want to know where it comes from, where it goes. How's it, how's it being managed? How does it affect people? So we developed a certification program, which is now in the public domain for constant improvement. Third party, independent, peer reviewed. And this is what we share with Google as well. So in this search for the good, let's just keep it simple for the kids, right? Good, clean water is good. Dirty water is bad, right? So when you think about trying to deal with platonic perfections of truth, beauty, and equity, and rights, and um, the, the humanism of our relationships, morals, ethics. You can talk about the good. If you look at Aristotelian science and math and statistical significance, of which you know, Google obviously is a part, uh, and, a, and a practitioner of, of statistical significance, then you've got uh, the math, right? So if we try and, and put this together, we realize to start with the good, it's easier than right and wrong. Because right and wrong, 
lead us to politics and other things. But good and bad are pretty basic. So let's say if we have good materials, good economy, good energy, good water, and good lives, what would we do? So good materials would be safe, healthy for ecological and human systems. They would be biological and technical nutrients. That would be first. So things that go back to nature, things that go back to industry. What I want from this cup uh, that we were drinking out of here that was PLA is compostable. That can go back to the biological cycle. This is polyester terephthalate. This is polyethylene. This can go back to technical materials. So let's just imagine it that way. Two nutrient cycles. A good economy would be circular, of course, putting the re back into resources, but only if the resource itself is safe and healthy. It's next, so it's quality first, then quantity. Sharing, Uber, Airbnb, sharing things that we could use to get more utility from them, of course, is a good idea. But finally, shared, because it was pointed out at the World Economic Forum that eight people in this world, individuals, six of whom are American, have the equivalent wealth of three and a half billion people. The bottom half of the economic spectrum. So is that shared? Then we think about the linear economy, and what we do is take, make, and waste. And so as long as we do that, we're going to run out of stuff, and everybody worries about decoupling materials from uh, our uh, economy because of the problems of their connection. But if you then put it in a circular economy, we can start to think about how we might even be able to restore the natural world with an economy that reuses. So we've been working with companies like Steelcase, Herman Miller, so on, to design chairs that can be disassembled. Say a chair like this is very simple. It's got a foam, it's got a polymer, it has a, a fabric. This one, I think, is a, um, is a polyester. And then you've got steel, rubber, and so on. Now, these can be designed to go back into systems. Fine, now we have to figure out how to get that done. We, we worked in the carpet industry very vigorously. What you want from a carpet, we pointed out, is just service of the carpet, acoustics, appearance, and so on. And if you think of it as a relationship instead of a resource, the carpet can be sold to the customer, but taken back by the carpet company as their raw material in 10 years. And then we can recycle 1.4 billion pounds of carpet material every year and have a perpetual carpet industry if we design it cradle to cradle and it's safe and healthy and we use renewable power, and so on. Change the carpet, the world gets better, more jobs. Good. Okay? What's really happening there is you're storing your materials on your customers' floors. So when we look at biological nutrition, we do textiles where we've done cotton, polyesters, um, uh, or excuse me, cotton, uh, wool, ramy, and so on. And we just announced last uh, two weeks ago in Amsterdam the first 100% of the molecules assessed for ecological and human health t-shirt at mass market price. They're making half a million of them, CNA. It's pretty exciting. So 100% of the molecules assessed for ecological and human health. So the future involves mining of a different sort. This is mining circuit boards. If you mine gold out in nature, it's $210 a ton production. If you mine it from, t from circuit boards, from phones, it's worth 27,000 a ton. And we can get it done without any contamination. It's quite astonishing. These factories can be self-contained. When we looked at a washing machine 25 years ago and said, it's really a service. You want to wash clothes. You don't need to own rubber gaskets and steel and glass. Everybody said, well, you're communists because you don't believe in ownership. And we're saying, well, what do I need? I mean, think about a building. This is a building we designed for Bosch and Seaman who make, guess what, washing machines. And think of the building. It's a showroom. It's a washing machine. It's a giant vessel with people all over it. And, but the fact is that you can have these on a 15-year lease, and the materials are valuable, and, and valuable to the people who can use those materials, not you. You get to wash them clothes. Here you get to work or live. This building can be converted to housing in the future. In Amsterdam, we're doing a big, big project where we look at the materials in the building as assets, perpetual assets. So we design them with, with our computer coding so we know where everything is. The steel beam can be sold as a steel beam if the building is taken down. If you do it this way, designed for disassembly, with the buildings as perpetual assets, the cost of tearing down a building in 15 years, if the bank ends up with it, to get it out of the way is 80 euros a square meter. The, the value of selling it, if we do it this way, is about 120 euros a square meter. So there's a spread of about 200 euros a square meter, about $20 a square foot, but the difference of designing it one way or the other, and this, this attaches itself to your current pro forma because it's a massive risk reduction for the finance community. So these buildings are all designed to be converted to housing in the future. Uh, this is the waste treatment system for the project right here, turn it into an asset instead of a liability. Here's a building we did for IBM that is now being converted to housing 
and the developers called us and said, we can't believe this. We took your floor plan and it's housing. We said, yeah, we designed it that way. We designed the building to be converted to housing in the future, just in case they didn't need offices. Why wouldn't we do that? How much fun. So that's part of why we won this award at the World Economic Forum for being the founders of the circular economy. The circular economy is really important as long as we see it as a joy of perpetual assets that have benefit to society. So this is a little pavilion I put in front of, on top of a, a men's store and a beauty parlor at the entrance to the World Economic Forum. It's made from two pieces of aluminum, A and B. They're only two parts. This building was, structure was put up in one day. Um, and it lives during the year in places like Amsterdam, gets brought back up, fits in a container. Uh, the walls are made of, of um, a new nanogel, aerogel insulation. This thick is equivalent of that much foam, cradle cradle certified. So we want good energy, not just less bad energy. So we designed NASA's space station on Earth in Mountain View, of all places. And this is the design team we used. So we said to the people here, we went to Houston, to the Johnson Space Center, where they heard the words, Houston, we have a problem. Remembering, too, that this is the capital of oil in America. And when Sheikh Yamani formed OPEC, and they said, when do you think we'll see the end of the age of oil? His answer was, I don't know that we'll ever see the end of the age of oil, but I do know that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> so if we really think about it, these people invented the photovoltaics so they could nuclear power a space station. Well, here we are, down here on the blue planet. So instead of going to Mars right away, let's come back to Earth. This building's in Mountain View. It has the potential of making 120% of the energy it needs from renewable power and purifying its own water. It's cradle to cradle materials. And to keep my sunshades from disappearing during value engineering, we put the structure on the outside of the building, as they do for wind tunnels, so that <clears throat> if anybody tries to get rid of our sunshades, the building falls down. Um, now, this is an important picture, I think. This is from the Middle East. This is Abu Dhabi and, and Dubai. This is 800 megawatts of solar energy coming. What's interesting about this is the contract for the price, 2.9 cents a kilowatt hour. That's half the price of wind, half the price of burning gas. Solar, game on. Here it comes. Now, these are running north-south, not east-west. We'll get to that in a second, and here's why. This is an experiment going on at Davis with some friends of ours. And this is solar collectors that rock from east to west during the day. And it brings back all the grasses, the agriculture, the water in the soil. All, it's unbelievable. The fungus starts to grow because of the shade. And so this idea, I think, of actually being able to do five economic strains at once, fiber, food, water retention, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, cool, uh, cooling, atmospheric cooling, and um, solar energy, uh, and actually the production of clean water, because we can use them as dew collectors in the morning, and then use it as focused irrigation in the afternoon. So um, this is an astonishing set of pictures, I think. So when you take that and translate it, I call it solar orchards. It's a form of silviculture. Here's a building we designed for the Netherlands that can produce more, than, more energy than it needs to operate and purify its own water. And, is the, it has a budget the same as a normal office building. So what is good water? Good water is clean and it's available. It's a human right. So the idea is not just can I take out some of the lead. The idea is every child should have clean, healthy water. So we've designed textiles where the water coming into the factory comes out clean, clean enough to drink, which means you'd rather use it again, which means you don't have any water coming out because all you lose is evaporation. So all of a sudden, we realize that our factories can be a purification rituals. This is the world's largest green roof at the time for Ford Motor Company. Uh, this is, um, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago. And we used this to purify all the water on the site instead of chemical treatment plants and pipes. And it saved Ford $35 million day one, CapEx, which with the Ford Taurus at a 4% margin is the equivalent of walking into the board and giving them an order for $900 million worth of cars, the world's largest green roof. So this is a drawing of a factory by me as a 10-year-old. And on the left, this is what you look at for a factory. And on the right is what we'd like to look at for the future. So this is our factory for Method uh, under construction. And it's got the largest greenhouses on a building in the world now. That's what I've been told. And it's a factory that's wind powered and solar powered. And the great thing about something like this, imagine a child in Pullman uh, in Chicago and when you ask them what is a factory, instead of drawing a thing with smoke coming out of it, they draw this. 
They draw things that are growing food for the neighbor. They have, it's a food desert there. They don't have fresh food. And so now they have jobs making fresh food. This is part of what it means to have a good life, safe, dignified for your kids. And we can actually design all kinds of strange and wonderful things. This is a factory in India we did where we put all the structure on the outside of the building to keep it out of the factory so it's clean. But we can do all these different things with this structure. We can grow food up there. Um, we have solar collectors up there. We have jobs up there. So you're not only in the factory making jobs. This is our first tomato right here. There it is. Um, the families can grow their organic food here as well as work here in the sunshine. Now, part of this is the idea of sharing. And I, I just want to show this man. His name was Vent Kataswamy. He died, I don't know, five years ago now. A cataract surgeon. But he said, why is it $1,900 to get your eyesight back when you're 80 years old? I can do it in 10 minutes. It's, it's, um, it, all I need is a cubic meter of sterility and one scalpel. And this un interocular lens is $200. Why is it $200? We have contact lenses that are disposable. Why is this $200 each? And we have blind people. And I can give them back eyesight in 10 minutes. So he said, what if I gave it away for free? I could go to scale because I have my own factories. And then we'd see what it costs for the rich people. Anyway, but when he died, he'd given eyesight to 3 million people for free. 3 million people for free. And the people who could afford it had to pay $50. And he had seven hospitals. He built the business to become immensely successful by collapsing the price for those who could afford it. And everyone else gets it for free. And because they get it for free, the other people can afford it. I mean, think about that. So the model becomes a different question. We change the question of statistical significance from how much can I get for how little I give, the question of modern commerce, to how much can we give for all that we get. We move from limits and greed to abundance and sharing. Thank you. time for questions for Bill, but I'm going to, while you think of your questions, I'm going to start with a few that I've had for some time. Um, the first is, I know how many decades it's taken you to achieve many of the things that now they look like they're, they were easy, but I know how hard they were in a world where no one was really addressing these issues. How do you stay optimistic? How do you hold that long vision? that um, we now are all benefiting so much from? I think it, it comes back to the children. The, in the Irish tradition, in the ancient Irish tradition, the, um, there were five worlds, and the first was this one. And the second one is called fairy, where the way they describe it, it looks exactly the same as this world. It's just a little bit better. So I try and spend <laughs> as much time there as possible, because otherwise you get depressed. And, but the third world is called Tirnanog, and it's the land of the forever young. And, and people in this world think that it might be nice to be forever young. It's a Persephone myth. And, but it's underwater. It's in the umbrage. And the forever young call us the immortals, because we can have children, and they can't. That's interesting. And they're waiting for Armageddon. They're waiting for the shoe to drop. Boom. Like that. So acting as if you're forever young means you get this sort of pathos and this fear that all of a sudden things will end in an instant because you're forever young. So, and I think that issue for me, if you look at what happened with the nuclear uh, bomb in, in uh, the middle of the last century, after that point, people started living as if there might be no tomorrow. So we started creating planned obsolescence. Party up. Because there might be no world tomorrow. So what difference does it make if you use lots of paper? The world might end in a moment. And so I think we've started living as if there's no tomorrow. We're acting as if we're forever young. And I think it's, it's starting to haunt us now. Because we see both the, 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 what, what happens because we think that way on a day-to-day -day basis. But also, we start doing design. We call it design for end of life. I mean, really? Design for end of life. If design is intention. Is our intention to end life? You know, we, what if we are successful? Oh, no. So 
we say design for next use instead of design for end of life. You know? And once you say, I'm designing this for next use, then you don't look at this and say, oh, oh plastics. Uh. You go, oh, a durable form of carbon. Hmm. If I recycle that using solar power and so on, I could use this over and over again for many generations. This becomes an asset, not a liability. Okay? So that's why I'm always optimistic. Because where everybody else sees liabilities, I see assets. And possibilities. And possibilities, yeah. Bill, who inspires you? Other than you? Who inspires you? <laughs> yeah. um, well, you do, um, that's for sure. I mean, you look at what you've accomplished, it's quite astonishing. I, uh, my, my hero as a child was Gandhi. I was, I was in Hong Kong, and we were a British colony. And I thought the questions he, were, he was asking were really so critical. And in a country where soil is the source of, of all the relations. And I, I th when I became an architect, and one of my first projects was to look if I could design a Hindu temple. So I, for, for um, a, a Hindu community. And so I went to India for six weeks and had a begging bowl and lived in a, with a Hindu community as a beggar, and, and I studied the, the uh, Shastras for the design of Hindu temples and realized it was just something I could never do because you need to be inured so deeply in the culture to do something that was meaningful. So, but the part that really struck me was that in order to build a Hindu temple, you had to take usually a rocky spot and then you had to bring it to life. You had a three-year protocol to create fecundity there. You had to make it healthy and full of food and benefit and flowers. It was amazing. It's a very prescribed process. And then you, you give the soil that you just made from the sun and the rocks and the air and the water, fecundity, growth, and then you give that to the farmers around it and build the temple. The temple has to be built on a place that's alive. Isn't that beautiful? So I found that to be something I like to do as a ritual. I think it's an important idea. And when I was at the Museum of Natural History here, the, in the rotunda on the way into the hall of the African peoples, they have this quote. And, it's, and I looked it up online later saying, wow, who, who's Gala? It was attributed to Gala. I said, this is some kind of Latin. What is this? And Gala was a sub-tribe of the Orono in Ethiopia. And the poem, which they then state, is like nobody knows what this means. Here's the poem. One is born, one dies. The land increases. That's the poem. Wow. What does it mean? The world gets better because we're here. Biology. One is born, one dies. It's the soil increases. So that's why I'm optimistic. That's great. So I have one more, and then anyone who wants, oh, we've got, we've got a question here. OK, I'll, I'll hold mine. Yes. Let me repeat the question. Yeah, so sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, if I get it r wrong, let me know. Is what is the main obstacle be between us using solar, uh, wind, and other forms of clean power from the conventional practice we have now? Yeah. Right? I think there's, it's very straightforward, really. That it's the incumbency of existing actors. People become positionally conservative because that's what they're doing, and that's what they want to keep doing, so they protect it at all costs. So that's up what you're up against. What you're coming in with, which are what I would call the, the tools of waging peace, um, are, are the, you have the, we have the things that don't require regulation, because typically these are relatively safe. Uh, in the case of solar and wind, they provide an immense number of jobs, so we can argue that one for sure. And the price has collapsed in the case of solar because of commoditization of solar collectors, which is a bit of a rough and tumble road 
you know, with a, a dramatic moment with the Chinese dumping solar into the world. So it caused a bit of a shock. But it, it's all part of the collapse of the cost of these things. So, so in, in the end, I think the economics are going to be the key driver. So when, when President Trump says we want to bring back all the jobs in coal, uh, the language might want to be, and as I think it will play out, when you look at the coal companies and some of the other facilities they're developing, even in West Virginia, it's interesting to note they're solar powered um, because it's cost effective. And when you think about it, it's quite astonishing. We're seeing solar energy in West Virginia at about 4.7 cents a kilowatt hour. Well, that's the same price as buying coal fired electricity. So the economics are coming. And I think it's really the job creation because there are going to be a lot more jobs putting up solar collections in West Virginia than having big equipment tear off mountaintops. It's economic uh, coming only recently? Uh, yes. Or, uh, it's quite recent in the big picture of things. It's been within the last five years that we've seen the, the tipping point. But we, have to, we still have to look at, you know, we're at a point now if they just strip subsidies of all kinds off of every source of energy, you know, the renewables would just take over. You know, so this idea of saying we're not going to give, we're not going to give subsidies to solar because we want to bring back the coal. Coal is subsidized, oil is subsidized. They're all subsidized, one way or the other, tax credits or otherwise. And if you just strip it all off and say we're going to be economic creatures, let's go get the right stuff done. You know, and if you add the cost of regulation and you add the cost of cleaning up things or you add the the perpetual liabilities we create, um, renewables are going to win hands hands down. So. I think we'll keep pushing. Thank you. Yes. I don't think, does this work? Okay. So first of all, thank you. This is really inspiring. I mean, um, just uh, uh, refreshing to see this way of thought, even for you know someone that's very into uh, ecological causes and recycling and all that. Um, to embed all that into design thinking is, is very refreshing and very inspiring. Um, I want to have actually a follow-up question to what, what you just discussed. Uh, I, I, I tend to agree that our biggest barriers are um, um, uh, yeah, conventional thinking and doing things the way we've always done them. And you know we've developed quite a culture and quite an economy based on scarcity and greed, and it's hard to change from that. And, and I'm... I, for one, don't have a lot of hope for adults, but I do have a lot of hope for, for children. Um, and I want to touch about what you just talked about. So, yeah, that economics, uh, economics are a great driver, probably the best driver for stuff, at least in our capitalistic culture, for sure. Uh, there are some things, though, that, you know, are probably best not left to economics. For just to give one example. Everybody recycles glass here, I imagine. Uh, it's been very big for the last few decades, but really nowadays, glass recycling is not economical. In fact, some some uh, um, localities in the state stopped recycling glass because it just costs too much to, uh, to transport it, and it's easier <coughs> and cheaper to manufacture. So here the economics are kind of upside down, right? They're driving us to do the wrong thing. Um, how do we, so, so this is where I think the only chance we have is to change the way we think, right? And how do you, I mean, do you and how do you see integrating this wonderful way of thinking into educational programs so that the next generation will make all the right choices regardless of the economic incentives? Great question. Um, I, I, uh I think that the, if you design it for 10-year-olds, see, 10-year-olds look at this stuff and consider what I'm talking about is to be obvious. That's really important. When I heard the other day that Cradle to Cradle is now used in a very famous English university in the course on rhetoric in the English department, I, I heard they're a little grumpy. It was written by an American. But um, uh, it's how to make an argument in the English language so that when you finish reading it, you say, well, that was obvious. <laughs> and then you think back, and before you read it, it wasn't at all. So what is that? And I think we've reached that point of the obvious. Now, when you think of glass, for example, in the recycling, you're absolutely right. We can still sell clear coal at a MRF, a material recovery facility in the United States. Clear glass is still economically 
uh, recyclable, but the color glass, which is most of it, is not, et cetera. So there, there's mountains of it around. So one of the things to do immediately on that is to say, what can we use it for? For example, while we you know, transition from glass or, or continue, continue to use it, it's quite a lovely material and quite optimized, actually, in many respects, is we could be making things with it. So I think we could have local manufacturers um, in places making kitchen counters out of it, whatever we want. There's plenty of things to do with glass as an aggregate. So start to think of it as a resource rather than a waste and then see what happens. You know, don't just say I have to remelt it and turn it to glass again. You can turn it to other things. So that's, that's one kind of element. The other is as we look at these materials, uh, I wrote an essay for the science journal Nature that they entitled Carbon is Not the Enemy. And I, I was calling it a new language for carbon. And the thing that made me so sad, and this get, brings us to the children who see this as obvious, is that they had a, a, a at the TED conference, which is going on now, last year, um, the Prime Minister of Bhutan got up and said, we're going to be a carbon negative country, and, and that's good. And it broke my heart, because to be a carbon negative country being a good, that means carbon itself must be a negative. So you have a double negative making it good, right? The problem is, Less and bad are not numbers. Less is a relationship of numbers. Bad is a human value. So you can't multiply less and bad and get a positive result. It's bad by definition, just less so. So the idea of carbon negative as a positive broke my heart because carbon is source of life. So, so really, it's the human behavior. So this new language, I basically said, what if we treat carbon emissions in the atmosphere today as a toxin, and then we call that carbon negative behavior? And let's call the carbon fugitive, because the value of a tool is put there by the user and the intention of the user. So a hammer in the hands of a child is a toy, in the hands of a carpenter is your house, in the hands of a maniac is a weapon, right? So the hammer is innocent. So is carbon. So carbon, unnatural carbon in the atmosphere, not good. Fugitive carbon. Then in the middle of it all would be durable carbon, a limestone mountain sitting calmly, or plastics, which are carbon, that are being recycled across generations over and over again. That's a durable form of carbon. So we call that durable carbon. If we burn it for energy, whoo, fugitive, oops, nightmare, carbon in the atmosphere. So do not call this waste energy thing renewable power, which we do in the United States, by the way. EPA characterizes waste to energy as renewable power, which is insane. Then you've got this ends up in the oceans and we now hear that by 2050 the amount of plastic in the ocean will be equal to that of fish. How are we doing? A statistical significance, right? So that is durable carbon getting fugitive into the ocean. Oops. Right? Wow. So I'm working on a project to try and figure out how we stop that flow. Then if you have carbon in soil, you have living carbon. So fugitive carbon, durable carbon, living carbon. And living carbon accrues more carbon from the atmosphere. And so we can start designing things that send carbon back to soil, right? even polymers like this. And we can even design these polymers to biodegrade and compost into soil. Because I see this oil as ancient soil, just, you know, they just added an S, right? Add the S and go to soil. So put the S back. So we can use various things like succinic acid, open up the polymer chains, and design these things to go back to carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and build soil with them too. So that whole thing because of a design system. So that's a long answer to what to do about the glass. It's, it's a funny thing that you brought up that question, though. Interesting that you brought up that question. In our, um, sometimes it's thinking beyond the problem. In our construction projects, we're now looking at using local recycled glass as a poslin, as a, as a um, ingredient in concrete to replace fly ash, which is a derivative of coal. So I think sometimes you notice these problems and then in, in you know, the circular economy, you can think beyond it and solve two problems, really. I'm sorry, just a, just a quick, quick follow-up. I guess what, what ultimately I'm, you have your wonderful book here, 
I, I want the children's version. Ah. <laughs> I want, yeah. I want, yeah. I want someone I know. to guarantee. I know. I get asked that every week. That, that, uh, <laughs> that the next stuff. generation is less influenced by our old and outdated conventions and our cynicism and our greed and scarcity and inspired to do this. I think that's why I created the five goods because we were working on a fashion center in Amsterdam for a fashion initiative for the world to take on fast fashion with this concepts of cradle to cradle and cradle to cradle certified. So I called it the five goods so that it could be just a free set of terms that are basic to everyone on the planet. This is good, that's bad, that kind of thing. So the, the five goods is the, is the title of my children's book to come. Yeah. That's such a great idea. Yeah. Okay, this side of the room. Okay. Um, I had two questions, but I'm going to decide to take the good question rather than the less bad question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's pretty open-ended. Uh, I think just I was really inspired by your work. Great stuff. Glad I came, and thanks for sharing. And I think it would be great to hear some ways that we could kind of translate that to our own lives as someone who's not always thinking about it, but anytime I do, I'm inspired by it, and I want to be involved and contribute in some way. So do you have any suggestions or mantras or ways to get involved that you think kind of like the layman could uh, contribute to, yeah. to the, the circular society? Right. It's a great question. How do we do it in our da daily lives? I think for me, one of the great joys is contemplating the garden. Think about the machine in the garden, right? And you're, you're living in the garden. So do that. Live in the garden. So think about, like, grow food, heal soil, compost. All those are basic actions that connect you back to the soil. Walk barefoot. Take trips to places where you can't use your phone because you feel stupid, you know? Where you have to look at the bubbling stream and say, I can't talk on a phone. I have this bubbling stream here. You know, it's too beautiful. That kind of thing. Go out in the natural world as much as you can. Celebrate your presence there. And that, that is part of, I think, of the healing that goes on with this. Because even if you look at uh, the, the notion of our daily activities, this, this notion of sort of the platonic purity of the joy of beauty and truth in the human imagination and, and with creativity, that an experience, that's, that's really important. And I'm sure you celebrate that every day when you have revelations in your work and so on. Then there's this issue of how do you act on wisdom, which is the Aristotelian question. If you know this beauty, then how do you behave? Right? What do you do? Right? So it's essentially how do you get from your values to value creation every day. So if you live in the world of value creation, like just money and number, right, you can pound your way up through tactics and strategies to goals but you can't get to your values of what's right and wrong. You're in the world of number, see? But if you start with your values, what do you think is right and wrong? Live that, then develop a set of principles to behave by that don't move. That's why I wrote something called the Hanover Principles. For us, these are design principles, things that don't move. Respect the relationship between, between spirit and matter. Huh? Insist on the rights of humanity and nature to coexist. Eliminate the concept of waste. Respect the limitations of human design. Be humble. Right? If anybody has trouble with humility, just know this. It took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. <laughs> you know, we're not we went to the moon before we had wheels on our luggage. You know? So we're not that smart. It took another 20 years to put four wheels on our luggage. But you know, we're, we're moving. <laughs> but but the, you know, have some humility here. Then, then you go to design, and you have visions. And we know that without execution, visions are hallucinations. I live there. That's what I do, visions thing. That's, I do that professionally. You know? <laughs> but, but I know that if they don't get executed, they're not real. Right? So then you go to your goals. Then you do your strategies. Then you do your tactics. Then you do the metrics. Then you show the value. Show the value last. Show your values first. Because as Peter Drucker pointed out, it's a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way. But it's the executive's job to do the right thing, right? Because if you're in the wrong business, you know, it doesn't matter how efficient you are. If you use Six Sigma 
statistical perfection, why you do the wrong thing, you become perfectly wrong, <laughs> right? So as a person, just try to live with your values and then exercise them every day. And if you grow safe, healthy food for yourself, just try that. Watch what happens, because you're doing the right thing. And you can get all cut up and doing it the right way, which is fun, because <laughs> it's a curious thing to do. Watch things grow. Thank you. One more quick question, Emily. Yeah, I think my question's changed like 35 times since I've been standing <laughs> here. Um, I do sustainability here for you, those of you that don't know, and waste initiative is kind of our focus this year. Um, so you, you talk a lot about you know, getting people to go back to their values and, and really it's, it's everybody that has to think about it. So one of the things that we did for Earth Week was set up a recyclables display that I think you might have seen. Did you see it, anybody? Commons? No? See, we did not publicize that enough. But it was a massive container that shows two separations. So one of them was clean recyclables, glass, metal, plastic, that can be recycled, and the other is dirty. So within this, this stream, like we're, at this point, we're working within the system that we have in New York, which if it's not clean, it doesn't get recycled, it ends up in landfill, we have other or incineration, it's terrible. So uh, trying to educate people, especially in a city that moves so fast and is so based on disposable, how do you try to bring that to people's attention I mean, I, I try and obviously gloom and doom kind of ways, like look at how much waste there is, um, drop the box campaigns so that people use a plate instead of a disposable, those kinds of things. And it, it seems to be something that people care about when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, but in masses, it's, it's difficult to get it to, to catch on. So how do you, how do you suggest that, that we get more people involved in those kinds of things? Um, it is one of the great questions. Um, I, I was saddened to hear recently that the tourists who went to Bali to see some exquisite tropical place with a culture that was gracious and gentle um, are not going now because the beaches are covered in plastic. And if you look at the history of Bali, it, it's only been one generation from when they used leaves for plates, and they ate with their hands. Right? So it used to be you went there and you got a plate, and when you finish with the plate, it's what we call soil compostable. It was like, bah. so a world where littering is fun, and it goes back to the soil. Oh my goodness! So I think we should learn from that, and if we can start to imagine that all of this detritus we have becomes exquisitely designed to go back to cycles. So people can go on with their lives, and littering is fun. See, right now, well, I'm looking at these giant projects for how to ro do roadmaps for packaging, as well as designing buildings and products. And um, part of what I have, I'm trying to figure out how to do is make it fun. So please litter becomes like, huh? And so I'm working on, uh, right now I'm working on e-commerce packaging that is all based on soil health and just for the fun of it, so that getting e-commerce instead of as some terrifying hybridization of strange packaging, I don't know, you've seen, but you get boxes this big with little things and bubbles of plastic everywhere. It's like the whole thing is just shows how insane it is. You know, so I think, I think it's a big design problem. The, when I asked Ron Ganen when he was Deputy Commissioner of Sanitation for New York, um, you know, what, if I could solve one problem for him, what, what would it be? See, they've built composters now. So they are taking compostables in New York and composting. But they can't see the cup that you're using here for water. This PLA, we just had some water in a cup. They're also flaring the, they're flaring the gas that. And they'll flare the gas that comes from all that. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's suboptimal. And so I think we need a marking system for all these materials that we can see. And it should, probably has to be optical so we can see it anywhere. It can be done by humans with two optical sensors, you know, very sophisticated. And, and our robotic 3D articulated elements, right? Um, so I think we need a marking system and I think we need to make this into something exquisitely beautiful. So we celebrate this. Instead of saying minimize, avoid, reduce waste and feel guilty, we say eliminate the concept of waste by design so that you can celebrate, optimize, 
and um, share the joy of packaging. When I was a kid in, in Japan, the package was the gift. Well, you've ever seen packaging in Japan? Oh, people will give you a gift, and it was so much fun. You'd unfold it, it was origami, you'd have a silk scarf, you know, and then the question became, who got the silk scarf? <laughs> you know, do you give it back? Because <laughs> you know, they can use it again, or do you get to keep it and use it for another gift? I mean, it's just all, it's a whole culture. Eggs came in rice straw, braided rice straw. Some of the sourcing people. Yeah, but his <laughs> biggest problem, Ron's biggest problem, he said, was hamburger, a hamburger, old hamburger, sitting in a plastic film in a foam tray. There was absolutely nothing he could do with that. And that starts to send the signals that we're going to have to do a lot more things that are biodegradable, compostable, coherently, all the way to the molecules, not into tiny bits of plastic, which we see today. Yeah, the zero waste by 2030. I, I sat in a in a group that asked the city organizations what they'd done so far, and nobody had an answer yet. So, we'll see. Optimism. Optimism, and you can be like Bill. Never give up. Yeah, persistence. Persistence. Okay, I think we've reached our time. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you, Bill. You're welcome. We so much appreciate it.